Hi everyone, thanks for having me back for I think my second time speaking here, third or fourth time being here. So thanks for having me back over and over again. So quick introduction, as I mentioned, I have birds. Those are Clang and Sharp. Um, so yeah, I'm a lead security researcher at Rapid7. Uh, my job is 50% looking at vulnerabilities that come out that we think are important, telling our customers like, should you panic, should you patch, should you like not worry? And the other half is finding vulnerabilities ourselves. So like picking a piece of software, like say the one we're talking about today, diving into it as deeply as I can and finding all the bugs I can. And I'm going to talk about the results of one of those projects. Uh, you can find me online. Uh, Yago XA6 is my general alias everywhere. Um, if Twitter is still up today, it will work. Uh, otherwise, Macedon or GitHub or whatever, whatever. And I've done lots of volunteer stuff. And yeah, I guess I work at Rapid7. I should mention that because they're paying for my uh, travel. So this is going to be a deep dive, sort of looking at some vulnerabilities in specifically in Rocket Software, uh, Uni RPC Server. I didn't name this software in the title because the vulnerabilities were on public when I submitted this talk. I found these back in January, submitted this talk in, I think, January, and then we disclosed everything in March. So it's all out now. But at the time I submitted this, it wasn't. So we're going to look at software called Unidata uh, 8.2.4. That was the one they had on their trials page, so that's the one I chose. It's finding software is often the hard part of these projects. And I'm going to talk about a lot of like protocol stuff and show some packet captures and show some like assembly and stuff like that. And I'll try to explain everything as I go and just kind of give you an idea of how I approach these kinds of projects. One of the questions I got asked by Rocket Software themselves and others is, why did you actually choose this? No one's really heard of this software. And like, it was kind of a personal, I won't say vendetta, but a personal project. Because when I worked at Tenable in like 2010 or so, this vulnerability came across my plate, a um, packet header heap overflow. And I figured out the protocol back then in like 2010 and thought, this looks really interesting. And I wrote the check for Nessus. Then I changed jobs and never came back to it until recently. And I thought, I really want to go back to this and see the software. So I found it and convinced my boss that it was worthwhile. Despite not being well-known software, it's apparently typically found on backends. So most large aerospace companies and banks and other companies use this just on the back end. So it's not, it's not usually internet-facing, but it's popular. So I'm going to talk about what UniRPC is, how it works, stuff like that. So basically, UniData and Universe and other tools made by this company come with a service called UniRPC, Unit Remote Procedure Calls. And UniRPC is an RPC server, which basically has a list of services and knows how to execute. A user connects on a specific TCP port that I'll mention after and says, I want to use this service. And it checks out its database and says, oh, I have access to the service. Here you go. And it just gives you a TCP connection to that service. And then you talk to that service directly from then on. All the, all the communication is done by standard packets. They have a header, they have metadata, they have a body. We'll see what those details are in a minute. So one of the first things I do is look for attack surface. So I install the software, I execute the software. That usually takes two or three days because of licensing and because of other, like, I have the wrong OS or the wrong version of Fedora or whatever, whatever. But when you eventually get it running, you can run netstat and see that it listens on a TCP port 31438 which I'm going to forget during a talk, but that is the port that is interesting. So what services can it actually execute? When you install the software, it comes with a file called uni RPC services. Um, I saw the file. I saw it being read by the process. And the first instinct I have is to like, reverse engineer the process to, to like, figure out what this file means. And like, if you look at the file, I think a lot of the fields, you can kind of guess from context. The first column, UDCS, etc., looks like a name. The second one are obviously binaries. They're in like a slash bin directory. The star, we can guess, might be an ACL of some sort. A protocol, a zero. And then 3600 is an hour in seconds. So guessing is a timeout. So I spent probably a day learning how it processes this field and what the fields mean and everything. Then while I was writing this talk, I googled the name of the file, and it, it's actually documented. So it turns out I, I should just read the manual. So I was correct, but this is what I often forget to do. 
So one such service in that is a UD server. And I'm just going to choose a service to talk about completely arbitrarily this time for now. So on the top line, you'll see the entry from that file we just saw. It's one of the lines in this file. Um, so if you have an entry in that file, when a client connects, it can send this packet that's here. If it's too small to read, it's not a big deal. This is not super important, all the bytes mean. But the first packet a client sends will be, hey, please use the UD server service. And the, the UniRPC will parse its file and say, is one of our services called UD server? Um, oh, there it is. And it'll execute that binary. So you can see in the, on the bottom, there's a, there's a debug log. It says found service executing UD servd. Obviously, if I'm doing an application review, I'm, I want to see, I see the executing and think, can I execute my own thing? Or can I only execute their stuff? And in this case, I can only execute their binaries. But that's definitely a thing I looked at. So we've seen, a, we've seen this packet capture a couple times. Let's kind of dive into what it means. I want to give sort of a quick overview. I have a lot of slides with a lot of packets on them. I'm going to skip to them somewhat quickly, because I just want to give you the, give the idea of how this works, not necessarily every single detail. And then we'll look along the way at the vulnerabilities we found while actually looking at these packets. So as far as I can tell, UniRPC uses a custom binary protocol, but I didn't actually Google it, so maybe it's documented. I don't know. Um, but even in the cases, if it was a standard protocol or was documented, it's always nice to reverse engineer it from the binary to see if there's anything interesting, like how does it handle length fields, and how does it execute other processes, and how does it you know, look, looking for vulnerabilities, are there undocumented header flags, stuff like that. So this was originally the end of the section, but I realized I was going to dive into a bunch, so I wanted to put the beginning of the section instead. So every message you see will have a 20-byte header, which contains the version, um, the size, number of parameters, stuff like that. Then there's some metadata, which is types. So basically, the client will say, like, I'm going to send you a string, an int, an int, and a string. And that's what the metadata is. It, I'm going to send you a 10-byte string and then an integer, and then the data, which is the actual string integer. So just really quickly looking at this, that, that is what you're seeing here, is a 20-byte header, uh, 16 bytes of metadata, and then the rest is the uh, strings. We'll see more examples of that. So when I'm looking at these kinds of applications, I want to look for attack surface. Where is it parsing packets? Where is it actually doing the things it's doing? So thankfully, when it's, a, when it's a Linux binary, I can run it in a debugger. And you see I'm using a GDB debugger, which is just a built-in Linux debugger that most people use in Linux. I also hacked the executable to get rid of the forking. You'll see UniRPC one shot. That just removes the fork, connect, fork command. I used to have a slide about that, but it was boring. So I put my blog instead. So basically, I run it in a debugger, and I put a breakpoint on the accept command, the accept syscall. The accept, accept happens, or not syscall, the accept function. That function is called by the, uh, by the UniRPC server to accept a new connection. So a client connects this accept call will complete, and there will be a new socket created. So I want to look at where that happens in the code. And there's a little bit of assembly code at the bottom. It's not a big deal. There's not actually anything too exciting happening. One thing I always like is looking at debug messages, though, like accepted socket is from IP number, which tells me that like, if I can match up that debug message with uh, a few slides back, you'll see the same debug message here, accepted socket is from IP number. So being able to match up things you see in the debug output with things you see in the binary is good. But this, the, the accept function is not super interesting. So I'll move on to where it does get interesting, which is receive. The first place I want to see is where the connection is accepted. The second place I want to look at is where the data comes in. Because the client's going to send it 100 bytes of data. The receive function is going to receive that data, and then it's going to get parsed. So the beginning of what's interesting or what's attackable is going to be what the receive function does. So you'll see, I, put a break, a, uh, I run the UniRPC one shot in GDB. I put a breakpoint on the receive function, then I run it. And then using some like netcat or whatever, I, I just send something. It doesn't matter what. And if things work correctly, it should hit the breakpoint and should say, I break while receiving data from file descriptor 8, which doesn't really matter, a buffer that is at this address. Again, doesn't really matter. We see it receives 8,216 bytes or less. That's an interesting number, because it's close to a power of 2. 
8,192 is a power of two. So it's a power of two plus a little bit, plus 20 or so, which sort of means something, not, not terribly important. What is important is the stack trace. So I run the BT command, which is backtrace, and that asks the, the debugger to tell me, how do we get here? What function called what function? What, what called what function to get us here? And what we see is the main function calls accept connection. And I should say, because we have like named functions, not memory addresses, we have symbols. And that makes it much, much easier to reverse than if we had to figure out what each function does. But we have accept connection, which calls read packet, which calls read message, which calls read n. Read n reads n bytes. It's, it's called with a function parameter of like 1,000, and then it reads 1,000 bytes. That's all read n does. And then read message is what's going to parse the header. So I mentioned there's a 20 byte packet header. Um, these are just a couple examples of code from it. What, what they're actually doing isn't super important. But when it reads the header, it reads those 20 bytes, and then it does checks like compare the first two bytes to, to 6C. If there's 6C, proceed. If they're not 6C, uh, return a error version mismatch. So basically, the first, six byte, the first one byte has to be 6C. Then the second byte has to be 0, 1, or 0, 2. Then the third and fourth byte are ignored, then the fifth, and so on. So I'm going to look for all these things and what's happening. One of the fields that's interesting, and this is where we're going to get into a vulnerability, is the length field. So one of the, one of, there's a 32-bit length field in the packet header. And it says the length of the body of this packet is going to be 20 bytes, or 100 bytes, or 1,000 bytes. And it's going to do some checks on it. First of all, this one, where it can hard read my own stuff here. Um, it, it checks the length of the uh, field. Ah. <laughs> I circled in red. I should see it. So it tests EDI. And EDI, it, EDI is like a variable. It, it happens to be the length. So it's going to say, test the length, jump if it's less than or equal to 0. So make sure the length isn't 0, and make sure the length isn't negative. That's good, because you don't want to, if, if the client said, like, hey, I'm sending you negative 10 bytes, the server is like, well, doesn't make sense. So it's going to make sure it's not negative. Then it adds 17 to the value, and then it does a second comparison. It compares the, the, the length after adding 17 hex to uh, the size of the buffer, which is 2018 by default, but that can change. So something you learn to look for when you're looking for vulnerabilities is doing a check to see if something's above 0, adding something to it, then doing a different check. Because integer overflows are a thing. And if your size happens to be very, very high, like 7F, F, 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 and you add 17 to it, the size is now negative. So the size was positive. You add 17, and now is it less than 2018? If, if it's now negative, yeah, it's less than 2018 by a lot. And that's what we can do. So if we send the size of 7F, F, 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 and then print it, we see 2.14 billion, I think which is the highest integer. Then down at the bottom, it adds 17 to it. We then print RAX, and now it's negative 2.1 billion, which means that it's wrapped around, and now it's negative. So if we send, if we send a body length of 7F, F, 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 when it goes back to the receive function, it's going to try to receive 2.1 billion bytes into a buffer that's 2,000 bytes. 2 billion is higher than 2,000, so that overflows and it overwrites memory and causes a heap corruption. So we call this vulnerability CV2023-28501. It's a likely exploitable heap overflow that I didn't write an exploit for because it seems really hard. And there were easier ones. So that's one vulnerability. This slide I debated keeping or not because it's not really an interesting vulnerability, but it's a silly mistake that they made. So one, one of the bytes in the packet header is um, compression. If it's set to 1, the packet's compressed. If it's set to 0, it's not compressed. The compression function they have is called LZ4 something, something, something. Uh, LZ4 decompress safe. So I tried, to, I tried to make test data for this. I tried to LZ4 compress that in different ways, and I never did figure out how to make data that actually worked, which is sort of funny. I wrote a blog that's linked at the bottom. I'll send you these slides afterwards if you want to check these links out. But I made the program generate its own compressed data, and then I was able to test this and all that. Uh, what's interesting is if you send invalid data, if, if the uh, LZ4 compressed safe returns a failure, there's only one 
thing, and it's either success or failed. It's not why it failed, which means if it failed, the program assumes that the compressed data was too long, and it allocates more memory and tries again. If it fails again, it allocates more memory and tries again. And it'll keep on, it'll keep on reallocating more and more memory until it tries to allocate like 18 billion billion bytes and then fail. So that's just a really silly DNL service just from forgetting to check buffer sizes. It's not, not exploitable, but just kind of a weird vulnerability. There's also an encryption field. So we, we looked at the length field. We looked at the, um, the compression field. There's also an encryption field telling the server that if this field is set to non-zero, the packet's encrypted. And by encrypted, I mean XOR by one. So basically, if the encryption's on, the encryption key is either two or one, depending on the version. And then the, each byte is XORed with that key, and that's encrypting. As, as far as I can tell, the real clients and servers never use this. But like my Metasploit module I wrote for this eventually does, because, I mean, why not keep the payloads off the clear text? So once the message is read, uh, we talked about the header. There's all these different header fields, and I have a list of them that I should have put earlier. But after the header is finished, it then reads the body. The body of the message is much, much, much more complex than the header. So, I'm, so rather than like going through the assembly and all these different notes I made and all this junk, we're just going to look at the packet captures and figure things out from the packets. <clears throat> so this is where I'm going to actually look at the traffic on the wire. The, um, at the top, you'll see the packets we've seen before, where you say, please connect me to UD server. And at the bottom, you see the version number come back. It's basically a success. What you're seeing is a header, metadata, and then freeform body. Uh, we'll see what each of those mean. So this is the header. We've looked at this a couple times. We talked about the version byte has to be 6C. The body length has to be non -zero, or above 0. Um, LZ4 is a compression field. Encryption is the encryption field. There are several padding fields that can be anything. I set them to like A, B, C, D in my implementations. Um, there's a number of arguments, and then there's a length of for the uh, data. Data length is not really used. I think that's a, um, it's parsed and processed, but it's not used by anything, so I think it's legacy. But arg count is what's interesting, because it's how many arguments are being sent. So here's some examples. I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. But this is where you can match up the packets you see in Wireshark to the packets you, to the uh, structure I, I gave. If you actually want to implement this protocol or something, you can probably go back and use these slides. But I'm going to skip through them pretty quick. So after the header, there's argument definitions. So you'll ha have zero or more fields. That's based number of arguments. So this packet has two arguments. The first argument is type 2, which is a string. And the second argument is type 0, which is an integer. So a string and an integer are the metadata. And then in the actual data section, you'll see the string is UD server. The YYY is just padding. And then the integer is 539, which is hex for 1337. That's the secure flag. And sometimes it's required to be set. But you can set it yourself, so it doesn't actually secure anything. So this just shows what I, ju what I just showed in a graphical way. The actual data section of packets is just the data. So we saw in this, we have a type 2, which is a string. The string is UD server. Then the, I just talked about this. And when the server responds, it does the same thing. The server says, I have two arguments. The first one's a string. Second one's an integer. The string is UD serve 8.2.4. The integer is 0. The 0 is just success. If the server doesn't exist, it'll be something that's not 0. And that's just showing the same stuff. <clears throat> So the TLDR, this is what the messages look like. <clears throat> yeah, I don't want to dwell too much, but I did do, it. I did do an open source implementation of this whole thing. Uh, this is from something I called libneptune. And libneptune is an implementation of the library that's in Ruby. And it's integrated to Metasploit as well. So if you ever want to write something for Metasploit involving uh, rocket, uh, uni data, you can. Um, I, named, I named libneptune after the Neptune Escape Rocket in Subnautica, if anyone plays Subnautica. Because Rocket, Neptune. Yeah. So I'm going to show you three messages that do a thing that's interesting, which is run an OS command. 
then I'm going to show you two ways to bypass all the checks that we're going to see, and then we're going to call it done. So here is a conversation. The first one is, please use a service. We're going to use the service UD admin. I think I've decided about why we chose UD admin, but I don't know where it went, so we'll see when it turns up. Basically, this says, please use UD admin. My secure flag is 1337, which means I'm 1,300 times secure. Then when you do that, it's going to run the UD server process. And the UD server process wants you to authenticate. It says, before you can do anything, please send me the packet code F, which is uh, 15, which says authenticate. And the username string and the password string. The username string you'll see is plain text. It's R-O-N and then Y, 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 because I just pad with Y's till I can see what's going on. And then the integer is going to be, yeah, the integer is 15. The string username is Ron. The string password is 969098. It's, it's encrypted, quotation marks. So I send the username, I send that password, and it simply responds with, this, with one integer value 0. One integer value 0 says authentication is successful. If you failed, it would be a non-zero integer. Then you can run a command. So opcode 6 means OS command. Once you've authenticated, and you have to authenticate as a Linux user on the machine, so you're basically as good as SSHing, you could tell it to run a command. There's like 150 opcodes. I've only tested the one, because once I run a command, I don't need the rest. So basically, you send the opcode 6, and then you send it a string with what to run. In this example, I just do who am I. And in the response, it returns Ron. It returns negative 2 for the uh, command result, which I'm not sure why it's negative 2, but it is. And then the string Ron. So, we, so with username and password, we can run code is what I'm saying. This is why I chose a service. I knew I put the side somewhere. So why UD, why UD admin server? It's because I ran strings and saw OS command. And once I see OS command, I'm just going to use that one, because it sounds like fun. It's also the biggest. It's by far bigger than the other processes. It's 300 kilobytes. The rest are like 20 to 60. So it's going to be the most interesting, the most code, and has OS command. Who can resist? So once you connect, you, as I said, you need to send authentication. You either send the code 15, or you send the code, I think, 6? No, 8. If you send 8, it returns coming soon and then closes the connection. It never came soon. <laughs> but if you give it 15, it authenticates you. Um, it'll look at your username as a string and then stir copy it into a buffer. Uh-oh. Um, if you send a name of 200 letter A's, you can overfly, over, nah, overflow the return address and send the return address to all A's. This we call CV 2023-28502. But now I'm lazy, and stir copy doesn't like null bytes. And I do like null bytes, because I want to return to a memory address. So I want to write easy exploits. Let's look at the password. The password is also stir copied into a buffer. After it stir copies it and terminates at null, it then calls a function called RPC encrypt. You would think that RPC encrypt would encrypt the packet. And it, well, it XORs a byte, or it negates each byte. It's like encryption. It basically goes through each byte in the password and knots it. So 00, zero becomes FF, 01 becomes FE, and so on and so on and so on. That's not really encryption. What it does mean is I can now use null bytes in an exploit. So basically, we send, I can't remember how many uh, return address offset is, but we send like 150 letter A's, then a return address. There's actually a return address in the software that will run whatever's on the stack, which if you're exploit dev is really nice. All it does is just pass whatever's in the RSP into the system call and then run it. So we can run like a reverse shell, like netcat. We can do whatever. So that this is the actual form of, of uh, CV2023-28502, which is basically a stack overflow, which lets us execute arbitrary code. And we wrote this exploit, and we released this exploit, and it's out there. But it's still hard. You have to over return addresses and do a bunch of work. So let's say we don't overflow the fields, which takes all the willpower I have to not overflow them. But if we don't overflow them, we get into a call called impersonate user. Impersonate user takes the username and password as parameters. Um, so if we look at the code for it, 
this is in the library now, it's not in the main XE level. It, the impersonate user just calls do logon user basically and nothing else. Do logon user is interesting because it checks if the username is colon local colon. It looks for a very specific username and if it matches that username, then it calls Sturcher to find a colon. Then it calls Sturcher again to find a second colon in the password. So you have a username colon local colon and the password of like A colon B colon C, something special happens. Something special means I get code execution. <laughs> so basically, after it parses it into A colon B colon C, it passes B, the second field, into str to L, which converts to an integer. So the number 1337 becomes the integer 1337. It also passes the third field into str to L. And then it does a couple checks. It passes the first field into get pwnam. Get pwnam gets, looks up a username on the local Linux system. So if I pass it ron, it returns the data for ron. If it passes it root, it returns the data for root. So if the first field of the password is ron, this will succeed get pwnam. The second thing it does is compares the second field to the user ID of that user. So if the username is Ron, it checks if the, the middle field was 1,000. If the username was root, it checks the middle field was zero. And if that matches, it keeps going. The third field, it only checks if it's non-zero. If it's zero, it fails. If it's one, two, three, it works. So basically, with the username colon local colon, the password Ron colon 1,000 colon 1,000 will succeed if the Ron account exists. It has UID 1,000. Uh, root colon 0 colon 123 will always work because root is basically always there and always UID 0. So here's a session. Uh, we, we connect to the UID admin service. We say, please connect to your username local. Password is encrypted, but it's root colon 0 colon 123. And then you say, please run the command ID dash A, and it returns hey, UID 0 root. The nice thing about this too is your root. It doesn't draw privileges. So basically, this is real code as root. So here's some of the exploit code I wrote. Um, this is the proof of concept that's in the lib Neptune repo. Um, yeah, you just pass the username local and the, the password root colon zero colon one two three. There's also some exploit modules for this. So just kind of wrapping up and summarizing the work we did, we ended up with nine CVEs for different things. Two of them we wrote full exploits for. The other seven. We either crash them or demonstrate them or whatever. Some stuff like memory exhaustion is like, yeah, the OS. The weak encryption was kind of vague. But like, I thought it was a pretty good outcome all in all. These are just screenshots of Metasploit. Uh, Metasploit has modules for the two vulnerabilities I mentioned. Um, yeah, and that is pretty much the end. I think, yeah, I have one minute left, perfect. I think we're doing a question session in 10 minutes, and other than that, um, that's a link to the slides. Feel free to uh, use it. Feel free to reach out to me on Twitter, Mastodon, GitHub, whatever. And thank you for coming.